I just want to do a quick disclaimer at the beginning of this video. There's an affiliate link to this product in the description box below. If you buy that or anything else from that site after clicking the link, I will be donating 100% of the pre-tax money raised by the affiliate link over the next 60 days to the CDC Foundation. I'm very grateful for the audience that I have here on YouTube, and I've been waiting for an opportunity to give back to the world, and this is a great time to do so. If you grew up in the 90s and you were lucky enough to have an allowance in an arcade near your house, then you probably remember dumping your childhood life savings one quarter at a time. Reigniting those nostalgic memories was the driving force behind the product in today's video. Hello everyone, my name is Taki and this is episode 4 of the Should You Buy It series. Today we're going to be covering the cheapest device yet, the Retroid Pocket. The Retroid Pocket comes with a quad-core A7 chip clocked at 1.5GHz with a Mali 400 GPU clocked at 500MHz. The unit comes with 512MB of RAM, 4GB of internal storage with anywhere between 32 and 128GB of additional storage, a 4000mAh battery, and a 3.5-inch 480p screen. The unit supports Bluetooth 4.0 and 2.4GHz Wi-Fi. All of this is running on top of either a dual or single boot Android 6 OS. This is a review of essentially two different products, so this is going to be a lot to cover, but I'm going to try to do it as fast as possible. Let's first talk about the analog stick because this is one of the bigger changes that went into this product. The original engineering builds that became third-party products actually have this stick mapped as a digital D-pad, which is not a good solution for games that use analog input values. This has now been fixed, and I can show you this by quickly using Mario 64 as an example. As you can see, Mario responds to the full range of analog stick values in the same way that he would on real hardware. The next biggest change is the new D-pad component. Even though I grew used to the older circle component, this one is a big improvement. And while I do like it, I will say I would have liked to have a small amount of texture on each of the directional inputs. That being said, the D-pad itself is very comfortable to use, and I've racked up over 100 hours with this component over the last three months. If I show you the profile, you can see that the center has a concave surface that gives you a place to rest your thumb. Most importantly, it's super easy to register accurate inputs on this device. From here, let's move on to the six input buttons. This style is obviously reminiscent of Sega and arcade systems, but it can still work for other platforms. For systems that only use two buttons, you're going to be using the A and B buttons. For other systems that use four, you'll be using C, D, X, A as X, Circle, Square, Triangle, or B, A, Y, X, with the Y and B keys functioning as the L and R buttons. I believe this was done because these four input buttons on a six button input most closely resemble the diamond shape seen in those other console controllers. It's also important to mention that these controller profiles have already been mapped automatically for you in every emulator that comes with this device. I also want to mention that Y and B function as L and R by default, but you also have the ability to use the volume keys as system-wide L and R keys with a new piece of custom software that was made a few months back. It's useful in some niche cases, and I'm going to use the DS to illustrate why I think it's useful. The DS is one of the newer systems that is very well supported on this open Android system if you pick up Drastic, but you will need to map a few actions to really make the most out of this device. The biggest challenge is to find a good place to set a screen swapping key, and I have this set to volume up right now with volume down pulling up the emulator menu. This next change came a little later, but swapping out your volume keys like this doesn't mean that you lose the ability to change your audio levels. You can actually access your brightness by holding start and pressing volume up or down or you can change your audio by pressing start plus d-pad left or right. I want to go back to the six input keys for a second because these have changed since the last time I talked about this device. There was some rightful criticism of the prior board due to how loud and tacky these buttons sounded before. This final revision swapped out the original switches for ones that make way less noise, and it's a noticeable improvement. I will say that I think these keys are also comfortable to use over longer gaming sessions due to the small amount of travel they have, but also because they have a much larger surface area than other input keys that I've found in other retro handhelds. Here's a quick comparison of those changes that I've been talking about with the release version of the Retroid Pocket first and now with the engineering unit. Flipping this over to the side and we can see another visual change that recently took place about a week ago. 
This LED light was actually very strong on the engineering units and the third party models to the point where it would absolutely blind anyone that you sleep next to if you were to try to use this at night in bed. But even if you sleep solo, the light on this was obnoxiously bright for no reason. The light has now been scaled way back to a level that should be more manageable in the situations that I've just described. Now to the top and first to our micro USB charging port. The original base charging frequency was increased, but there's no getting around the fact that this thing charges slower than many other modern devices. Based on all of my testing over the last five months, you should be able to get at least five hours of battery life with your brightness around 50 to 70% playing N64, PSP, or PS1. That being said, the device can take up to four hours to charge from completely dead, which isn't abnormal for retro devices, but it's a little more than I would like to see. You also have access to your TF card slot, and this white unit that I'm using has the 128GB SD card package, but you can still get the original standard 32GB card in the base package or the 64GB upgrade. I'm a little torn about the headphone jack. I do love the aesthetic of having this on the top of the unit because it reminds me a lot of the Walkman, but you'll obviously have have to use your headphone cable draped around the back of the device or held in your left hand to maintain a clear view of the screen. The single best part of this whole section is the fact that this device has exceptional video out via HDMI, which has numerous implications that I'll go over later in this video. It's sad that there are currently more retro handhelds in the market that have no video out or bad video out than the devices with a good solution, and this is definitely near the top of the pile in that regard. If I was to pick one thing that I like more than anything about this device, it's the fact that it has a 4x3 aspect ratio in a field of devices with 16x9 or 3 by two screens. If you grew up with systems that were played on old TV sets like I did in the 4x3 format, you'll know how important it is to have a 4x3 screen to be able to recreate that experience again. The 480p screen is also a big upgrade from the 240p options in this price range. Like many other devices that I cover, it's very hard to capture the quality of the LCD screen recorded with a camera, but I will say that this is on par or better than the other devices in this price range. It's a real 60 hertz IPS screen with zero screen tearing, so you will have great viewing angles all around with vivid color and exceptional brightness values. As an example, I'll quickly dim my studio lights to show you what this looks like from different angles. Protecting this great display is now a glass cover replacing the old plastic one that had issues that I've already pointed out in another video. This change actually happened last week because there were certain situations where it was still possible for the bubbles to appear on the December revision of this product, so the decision was made to replace the entire component with a glass one. This means that it will never be possible to have those issues ever again. The developer has also made a custom tempered glass cover for this new glass screen that feels super premium premium, especially when you compare it to the old plastic one. Finally, before moving on, here is a speaker test recording from the speaker grill at half volume. Let's move on to software, and this is going to be a much bigger section since these are essentially two different products that are available between the $75 and the $85 models. What they do share in common, however, is the open Android system that is identical, so I will start with this. Because we obviously do not have a touchscreen on the pocket, we need a good way of interacting with the system beyond plugging in a USB mouse. To solve this problem, you can use the analog stick as a mouse by entering mouse mode with a one second press on the home key. You can exit mouse mode in the exact same way. In this mode, you can increase or decrease the mouse speed by using the left or right D-pad buttons. You also have the ability to click by pressing the A button, with B continuing to function as a back button system-wide. This input has improved drastically over the last three months, and it's this mode that I use for almost everything on the system because it's so easy to use. The biggest use case for this in terms of gaming is on the DS touchscreen. I've already showed you how I have the screen swap mapped to my volume keys, so I'll show you how this looks all together. I swap the screen and hold down the home button for one second. Now that I'm in mouse mode, I can freely interact with the screen and select things with the A button. When I'm done, I just hold down the home button for one second and swap the screens back over. 
This greatly increases the amount of DS games that you can enjoy on this system, up from the decent collection of things that run perfectly without any touch input at all. Now let's go over gaming on the open system, and before I do that, I have to make a quick disclaimer that there are no games at all on the open system. There are also no paid apps on the open system, even though I will be featuring a few paid apps that I've put on the device myself for this review. What you do get with this device that I've never seen so far on other Android systems is a fully pre-configured product that you can get off the ground with in moments if you have your own ROMs. All of the settings have already been mapped for the best performance with a few exceptions and everything had controller profiles that felt good. There's a mix between standalone apps and a configured build of RetroArch that already had a bunch of cores installed. On screen is a list of all of the systems that are supported out of the box in the open system. I do just want to quickly illustrate my point about things being set up for you. I just flash this device and put ROMs inside the SD directories, and if I launch an app, you can see that all of my ROMs are already available to select. I'm going to go over this in detail in my getting started on the Retroid Pocket video, but essentially all I needed to do was put ROMs inside the pre-made folders that were already on the SD card, and all of the programs were already set to pull games from those directories. You can also see that the Play Store is on this firmware, but being that I'm in China, I opt for using ADB to sideload apps, so I don't need to install a VPN on the device directly. I've already talked about the volume key function, and that can be configured inside the Toolbox app. In here, you can clean up processes to free up RAM, limit the amount of background processes, change your volume key function, disable apps, which is very useful for Google Play after you've installed the apps that you want, and a view tips option that basically goes over what I've already shown. And here's just a quick look again at the app list. Now that's essentially it in terms of software for the $75 device, but the dual system on AliExpress has the added benefit of dual booting into the Retroid game system, but you'll have to install it via a side-loaded APK on your SD card or from ADB, and I'll go over that in the future video. When you do so, you'll be able to click on this little app and your device will reboot into the closed Retroid system. The first thing that I want to just get out of the way is the fact that this entire UI has been completely rebranded. There are now a bunch of low quality Pandora copies here in China and the name really stopped functioning as any meaningful brand. So the original manufacturer behind the Pandora game system decided to rebrand their devices to Retroid. On the game side of things, several systems have been completely redone. There are over 2000 games in this system with the majority coming from MAME and FBA. I will just quickly show you some of the titles in PSP, PS1, NES, SNES, GBC, GBA, FBA, and MAME. Now I want to cover some of the features of this system. First, let's cover the handheld settings. In this menu, you can connect to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Inside the Bluetooth menu, you can connect to pretty much any controller that you want now, but the biggest thing that you can do is remap the keys that are automatically set for you if you want to for whatever reason. If you go inside the redefined key setting menu, you'll see the mapping prompt that lets you set system-wide input keys to the buttons on your Bluetooth controller. In my case, my 8-bit do controller was correctly mapped with the exception of two input keys that needed to be switched around. If you head over to the game settings menu, you'll be able to change the filtering mode, which is on HD by default, but I prefer the way games look without this. There are a few other things here, like editing the difficulty and lives of some arcade games and favoriting the games that you want so they show up on the top of the ROM list, along with hiding games that you don't want to see, since there are numerous versions of some arcade games. You can also delete games if you want to prune back the games list and free up some space on your SD card for more ROMs, but the thing that we care the most about is the fact that you can now add your own ROMs to this system. When you're in this menu, you'll see a list of games that you've put on your SD card. If you're lucky, the games will already be mapped to the correct emulator based on their hash value. The fallback is to have you select which emulator should run the game. Once you do this, the game will update with the correct icon and it will now be found at the top of your game's list. And finally, we still have the game market for better or worse. This lets you download games for all of the systems that run on this device. However, this isn't without its own issues. 
For games that have correct English titles, it's very easy to find what you're looking for, but if the English translation has been botched, you're going to be scrolling through a lot of games to find what you're looking for. Performance between the open and closed systems is pretty much the same for the most part, but this wasn't always the case. You used to be able to get huge improvements in several systems by switching over to standard emulation solutions under Android, but they've incorporated some of those systems over to the Retroid system, so you should see improvements in SNES, GB and N64, even though you can get better performance from N64 if you customize the settings under Open Android. Finally, we are on to my favorite section, emulation performance. Because it's common between both models, I will be doing all of these tests under the Open Android system. I want to kick things off with SNES because it's my favorite thing to play on this. I originally used the right four input buttons for SNES, but that was total garbage and way too difficult to get used to, so I'm glad that they shifted this over. GBA also runs very well on this device, with performance that is comparable to the RG350, but there's also the added benefit of being able to do linked gameplay if you purchase the MyBoy emulator for Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connections. I've already highlighted performance of N64 in an older video, and nothing has really changed here for the most part since I was using the same emulator that now ships with this device. In total, I've tested over 40 titles, and all of my favorite games run well, including both Zeldas, Bomberman, Paper Mario, Diddy Kong Racing, and so on. The typical outliers are difficult to run on this device, so I wouldn't pick this up if you are itching to play some GoldenEye or Conkers on the go. I didn't expect it, but the DS actually runs very well on the Retroid if you install Drastic, and even though I already own a modded DSi, this is a serviceable option for people that want to delve into the great library of DS games and the collection of games that run well with limited or no touch controls required. There's a lot of great RPGs on this system that run without issues. I haven't tried out many games that need extensive touch input because at that point I would just grab my real DS, but it is cool to at least have that option at this price point. PlayStation 1 performance under RetroArch outperforms the RG350 and the PlayGo, but it won't be able to run Bloody Roar 2 at good frame rates unless you install EPSXE or FPSE. PSP is another platform that runs very well in the pocket. Over the last five months, I've probably tested around 90 or so PSP ROMs, and from those tests I've discovered the following. All of the 2D games that run at 60 FPS have no issues. Isometric 3D games that run at 30 FPS have no issues. The majority of 3D RPGs that run at 30 FPS have no problem, along with a bunch of 3D action games. More demanding 3D FPS games will require auto frame skip to run well. It's also worth noting that there are outliers that are just too powerful for this system like the God of War games unless you want to cause the internal frame skip to kick in to make the game playable. In all, I only found 8 games that I wouldn't classify as playable by any stretch of the imagination without really anything in common between them except for the two LEGO games. Dreamcast is our last system, and this is one that doesn't run well on the Retroid Pocket. The GPU just isn't advanced enough to take advantage of the best Dreamcast emulator that's out there, so we're stuck with Recast, which has its own idiosyncrasies that I'll delve into in my next video. I really only wanted to run Skies of Arcadia, which does run well, but there probably isn't a large collection of games that will run well or at acceptable speeds, so you may want to look elsewhere if your heart is set on Dreamcast. At the end of the day, this is an Android device, and there are a few games that support physical controls that do run well on this device. You'll have to do some digging for this, but I found that the Final Fantasy games run very well for what it's worth. The only thing left for gaming are the two cloud gaming apps that came with this device, and I've already put in a bunch of footage from both Steam Link and Moonlight in this video. I will say that if you have solid Wi-Fi in your house, you won't have any issues playing games that run well with the controls that the Retroid offers. Games that have fixed cameras or side scroll work best, but you can really do whatever you want. Now I've saved the best for last, and that's the HDMI out. I tend to use my Retroid in handheld mode exclusively, but the potential to use this as a low-cost home console with Bluetooth controllers can't be understated. 
there are a lot of games that come with the dual model that support two to four players with wireless Bluetooth controllers. So picking up one of these if you have a house full of people that can make use of it makes a lot of sense. I want to wrap up this video with some of my closing thoughts about the device after all of the time that I've spent with it. I was originally drawn to this over how cheap it was, but also due to the fact that it had a great screen for the games that I want to play. I think the control scheme is unique and it can work for more than just arcade games that it was originally designed to run and it's a great value compared to other devices in this price range. I do wish that this came with a bigger battery or that it charged faster because I've fully drained the battery countless times while I've owned it and it's a bummer playing tethered or waiting for the unit to completely charge again. I have five of these in total and I plan on giving away all but one in a future video but what I will say to people that are unsure of which to get if you have your own collection of ROMs already and you don't mind losing the UI and video snaps in the closed system Save the $10 and go with the Android only build. It will be the easiest product that you've ever had to use from day one and there really isn't anything on the market that remotely competes with how user friendly this thing is. If you don't have your own games and you also don't know the first thing about getting them yourself, go with the dual option which will provide you with more hand holding with the ultimate ability of dual booting into Android if you want to run systems that aren't supported in the closed system. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this review. This was a ton of work to essentially review two different products in one video, but I tried to make this as concise as possible. If this helps you one way or the other, please don't hesitate to leave a like below and subscribe to the channel to help support future reviews. I'll catch you here next time with another review. Now stay safe out there. Taki out.